it is not only a distinct privilege, but also a real joy for me to introduce today's speaker, Father James Martin. Father Martin is a prominent Roman Catholic priest and a member of the religious order known as the Jesuits. He's a best-selling author and an editor at large of the New York City-based Jesuit magazine, America. Highly recommended publication. Father Martin has authored more than a dozen books, amongst them the well-known The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, A Spirituality for Real Life, and his Jesus, A Pilgrimage. In addition to articles in America, he has written for numerous other Catholic publications, the U.S. Catholic, for example, Commonweal, and Catholic Digest. But he has also written for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. To top this, Father Martin has in fact had a book written about him. It's called James Martin in the Company of Jesus, an ingenious title. I think. On top of his publications, he's also a much sought after speaker and commentator. You might know him from appearances, for example, on NPR's NewsHour or my favorite, the Colbert Report. On the global Catholic scene, Father Martin serves as a consultant for the Vatican Office of Communication. I'm delighted today to be able to welcome Father Jim back to Yale. He spoke at St. Thomas More, the Catholic Center at Yale, three years ago to a totally packed house. Today at YDS, he's virtually present with us and will address the topic, Building a Bridge, Welcoming LGBTQ Catholics. Please join me in welcoming Father Jim. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Yale Divinity School uh, and Dean Sterling uh, for inviting me to give this Ensign Lecture. I'm really honored uh, to be back. Uh, I have a, a warm place in my heart um, for YDS uh, and for the wonderful uh, a chaplaincy there, especially the St. Thomas More Center that I'm very familiar with. Uh, and so I just wanna thank uh, everyone at Yale and everyone at YDS. Tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, building a bridge uh, between the Catholic Church uh, and the LGBT community. One of the more recent challenges for the Catholic Church is how to welcome LGBT people, uh, LGBT parishioners, as well as families with LGBT members. But that challenge is also where a lot of grace abounds because LGBT Catholics have felt excluded from the church for so long that any experience of welcome can really be life changing a healing moment that can inspire them to go to mass again, return them to the faith, and even help them to believe in God again. Over the past couple of years, I've heard some really appalling stories from LGBT Catholics who have been made to feel unwelcome in their own parishes. I'm sure you've heard the same, and I'm sure you can kind of fill in the gaps. Um, uh, a woman told me uh, recently that when she came out to her campus minister uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the campus minister, who was a Catholic priest, uh, said that he had prayed his whole priesthood uh, that he would never meet an LGBT person. Um, so you can imagine how that made her feel. But cruelty doesn't really end at the doors of the church. Of the church, uh, A few years ago, a woman can contacted me to ask if I knew if there were any compassionate priests in her archdiocese. Why? She was a nurse at a local hospice where a Catholic patient was dying. But the local parish priest who was assigned to the hospice was refusing to anoint him because he was gay. So is it any surprise that LGBT Catholics are made to feel like lepers uh, in their own church? The same is true for families, so families of LGBT people. The mother of a gay teen told me that her son decided to come back to the church after years of feeling that the church hated him. 
After a lot of discussion, he decided to return on Easter Sunday. The mother was overjoyed. When the mass began, she was so excited to have her son sitting beside her. But after the priest proclaimed the story of Christ's resurrection, guess what he preached on? The evils of homosexuality at Easter. The son stood up and walked out of the church, and the mother sat in her pew and cried. But there's also stories of grace in the Catholic Church. A few years ago, a university student told me that the first person to whom he came out was a Catholic priest. And the first, priests, the first thing the priest said was, God loves you and your church accepts you. The young man told me that literally saved his life. Indeed, we should rejoice that more and more Catholic parishes and dioceses are places where LGBT people feel at home, thanks to both the parish staff and more formalized programs. My own Jesuit community in New York, and actually you can see it right out the window, uh, the church is called the Church of St. Paul the Apostle, which has one of the most active LGBT outreach programs in the world. The ministry is called Out at St. Paul and sponsors retreats, Bible study groups, speaking engagements, and social events for the parish's large LGBT community. Sadly, though, much of the spiritual life of LGBT Catholics and their families depends on where they happen to live. I mean, if you're gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, or queer, uh, you're a queer person trying to make sense of your relationship with God and the church, or if you're the parent of an LGBTQ person and you live in a big city with open-minded pastors, you're in luck, right? So if you live in the neighborhood I live in, um, right near the Church of St. Paul the Apostle, you're in luck. But if you live in a less open-minded place or your parish is uh, homophobic, your pastor is homophobic, either silently or overtly, you're out of luck. And the way that Catholics are welcomed or not welcomed in their parish heavily, heavily influences their outlook, not only on the church, but on their faith and on God, right? So it's not just their relationship with the church. Um, they extend that to their relationship with God, and they feel unwelcome by God. So that's a real scandal. Why should faith depend on where someone lives? Is that what God really desires for the church? Did Jesus want people in Bethany to feel God's love less than people in Bethsaida? Did Jesus want a woman in Jericho to feel less love than a woman in Jerusalem? So what helps the church become more welcoming and respectful? How can priests and deacons, sisters and brothers, directors of religious educations, lay pastoral associates, and all parishioners help the church become a home for LGBT Catholics and their families. So I'd like to focus on parish life tonight. And the following observations are based not only on conversations with LGBT people, but also on the experience of LGBT ministries and outreach groups that I consulted for this talk. And I asked them, what are the most important things for parishes to know and to do? And I hope uh, in this lecture you can uh, apply it to whatever your uh, situation is, your ministry, your church, your denomination, um, your religious uh, you know, affiliation. And I hope that it's not just uh, focused on Catholics, because I think these are, these are values and these are lessons that can apply to all religious organizations who are trying their best to reach out to their LGBTQ members. So I want to talk about three areas. First, what are some fundamental insights for parishes? Second, what can a parish do to be more welcoming and respectful? Finally, what might the gospel say to us about this ministry? So let's begin with six fundamental insights. Now, these might be obvious to people, uh, but, uh, but they need to be said. So first of all, when it comes to LGBT Catholics, first thing is they're Catholic. Now, that sounds obvious, but parishes need to remember that LGBT people and their families are baptized Catholics or, more broadly, are baptized Christians. They're as much a part of the church as Pope Francis, the local bishop, or the pastor. It's not a question of making them Catholic or Christian. They already are. So the most important thing that we can do for them is to welcome them into what is already their church. And remember, just to remain in the church, any church, LGBT people often have endured years of rejection and sometimes persecution. Our welcome should reflect that, too. Second, also obvious, probably among people who are watching, they do not choose their orientation. Sadly, many people still believe that people choose their sexual orientation, despite the testimony of almost every psychiatrist and biologist, and more importantly, the lived experience of LGBT people. You don't choose your orientation or gender identity 
any more than you choose to be left-handed. It's not a choice. It's not an addiction. Thus, it's, thus it is not a sin simply to be LGBT. Far less is it something to blame on someone, like parents, as many people often do. Third, they have often been treated like lepers by the church. Never underestimate the pain that LGBT people have experienced, not only at the hands of their church, but from society at large. A few statistics might help, and these are pretty surprising. In the United States, lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth are five times as likely to have attempted suicide uh, than their straight counterparts, five times more likely than their straight counterparts. 40% of transgender people in the U.S. attempt suicide. Among LGBT, young LGBT people in the U.S., 57% say they feel unsafe because of their orientation. Also, one study shows, and this is especially important for people at YDS, shows that the more religious the family they come from, the more likely they are to attempt suicide. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, for straight people, for straight young people, the more religious their family is, the less likely they are to attempt suicide, right? For young LGBT people, the more religious their family, the more likely they are to attempt suicide. And one important reason that LGBT youth are homeless is that they come from families who reject them for religious reasons. So parishes, all religious congregations, uh, all religious denominations need to be aware of the consequences, the real life consequences of stigmatizing LGBT people. Most LGBT Catholics have been deeply wounded by their own church. They may have been mocked, insulted, excluded, condemned, or singled out for critique either privately or from the pulpit. They may have never heard the terms gay or lesbian or LGBT expressed in any positive way or even a neutral way. And even if the hateful comments didn't come in a parish setting, they may have heard other Catholic leaders making hateful and homophobic comments. From their earliest days as Catholics and as Christians, they are often made to feel like they are a mistake. They fear rejection, judgment, and condemnation from the church. In fact, these may be the only things that they expect from the church. This often leads them to exclude themselves from the church. Parents of LGBT people face similar pain. There's a saying, when a child comes out of the closet, the parent goes into the closet. It can be confusing, frightening, and embarrassing for parents to accept the reality of their children's orientation or gender identity. Um, as a result, parishes must let families know that they are still welcome, that they have nothing to fear from the church and that the church is their home. One mother told me um, a few years ago that she felt that after her daughter came out, she had to choose between her daughter and God, all right? So we really need to welcome LGBT families. Fourth, they bring gifts to the church. Like any group, LGBT people bring special gifts to the church. Now, it's usually wrong to generalize about any group or stereotype any group, but for a group that has been seen in the church almost exclusively in a negative light, it's important to consider the many gifts of the group, right, which we often don't consider. To begin with, because they've been so marginalized, many LGBT people often feel a natural compassion to those on the margins, right? Their compassion is a gift. For example, if you were someone who was bullied when you were young, you know, straight or gay, when a young person comes to you and talks to you about bullying, you will have naturally sort of a, a deeper compassion for that person. They are often forgiving of pastors and priests who treat them like dirt, right? Their forgiveness is a gift. They persevere uh, in the face of years of rejection. Their perseverance is a gift. So all these things we need to count as gifts that the community brings to the church. In fact, recently, some American parishes have fired LGBT people after they were legally married. I'm sure you've read stories. And something about these situations always mystified me. Every time I would hear these stories, it would always be about the most beloved teacher, the most beloved parish associate, the favorite, uh, this or that. And it always made me wonder about that. I thought, is this some sort of you know, PR move, right? I mean, I'm in media, right? Is this just part of the story? But then I realized why. LGBT people working for the church really have to want to be there, given the way that they're treated, right? They stick with their ministry despite years of rejection. It's the same with LGBT parishioners. They must make a conscious decision to stay with the church, to persevere. 
So when you think about those gifts, you may have the same reaction that Jesus had with the Roman centurion, amazement at their faith. Fifth, fifth fundamental insight, they long to know God. Like many Christians, many LGBT people struggle with many aspects of the church's teaching. For for Catholics, for example, terms like intrinsically disordered, which is in the catechism. But at the same time, many aren't as focused on those parts of tradition as people might think. Many want something simpler. They want to experience the Father's love in community. They want to meet Jesus Christ in the sacraments. They want to experience the Holy Spirit. They want to hear good homilies, right? Sing good music and feel part of a faith community, like everybody else. So treat them like that, not as protesters, but as parishioners. Help LGBT people and their families to fulfill their deepest desire, which is to know God. Six, they are loved by God. God loves them, and so should we. And I don't mean a stingy, grudging, judgmental, conditional, half-hearted love. I mean real love. And what does real love mean? It means the same thing it means for everyone, knowing them in the complexity of their lives, celebrating with them when their life is sweet, suffering with them when life is bitter, as any friend would. But I think it's even more. It's loving them as Jesus loved people on the margins, which is with a kind of extravagant love. So with those six insights in mind, how can parishes of any uh, stripe be more welcoming? How can we treat LGBT people with the virtues that the catechism recommends, respect, compassion, and sensitivity? Let me suggest 10 things. And by the way, very briefly, I'm using LGBT because that's the terminology I'm most uh, comfortable with. I've used it. You can easily use LGBTQ, LGBTQ+. I'm, I'm, I'm using it as a, as a kind of um, general term, so I want everyone to feel included. So let me suggest 10 things. Now, the following suggestions need to be fitted to your own parish or institution or organization. No one size fits all. First, examine your own attitude towards LGBT people and their families. Do you believe someone is sinful because she's lesbian or more inclined to sin than a straight woman? Do you hold the parents responsible for a gay teen's orientation? Do you think, here's something that's popular to think, do you think a person is transgender only because it's fashionable, right? Or because they're responding to gender ideology? And here's another question that a pastor asked me, uh, the pastor told me that he asks other pastors. I think this is really helpful. And it applies to all of us. If none or only a few LGBT people have made themselves known to you, Why might that be the case? Likewise, are you discriminating against them in your heart? For example, do you hold the LGBT community to the same standards as the straight community? With LGBT people, Catholics tend to focus on, many Catholic leaders tend to focus on whether they are fully conforming to the church's teaching on sexual morality. Okay, are you doing the same with straight parishioners? Those who are living together before being married or practicing birth control. So be consistent about whose lives you are scrutinizing. Pastors and pastoral associates are often much more sympathetic to the complex situations of straight people and trust their consciences because they know them, right? Do we treat LGBT people with the same understanding? What can you do about these attitudes? Be honest about them, but also get facts, not myths about sexual orientation and gender identity from scientific and social scientific sources not from rumors and misinformed and homophobic online sites. Then talk to God and your spiritual director about your feelings and be open to God's response. Invite your pastoral team and the parish to speak about their feelings and experiences. This leads to the next step, maybe the most important step. Listen to them, okay? There's something the church doesn't do a lot. Listen to the experiences of LGBT people and their parents and families. If you don't know what to say, you might ask, what was it like growing up as a gay boy in the church? What is it like being a lesbian Catholic? And an important question today, especially, what is it like being a transgender person? We still know very little about the transgender experience, so we must listen. Invite the parents of an LGBT child to speak with your pastoral team. Ask them, what is it like to have a gay child? How has the church helped or hurt you? How has your understanding of God changed? And pay attention to what they say. Overall, whether you are participating in a ministry like an LGBT outreach program at your church or a meeting with an LGBT person one-on-one, begin with their experiences. 
To that end, trust that the Holy Spirit will guide them in their formation as Christians. We don't treat other Catholics simply by repeating church teaching without considering their lived experience. So avoid doing that with LGBT people. Notice how Jesus treated people who felt like they were on the margins. For example, how he treated the Samaritan woman, right? The woman at the well in John's gospel. Does he castigate her for being married several times and living with someone? No. Instead, Jesus listens to her and treats her with respect. So be like Jesus. Listen and counter a company. If the church listened to LGBT people, 90% of homophobia would disappear. Third, acknowledge them in homilies and parish presentations as full members of the parish without judgment and not as fallen away Catholics. LGBT people should never be degraded or humiliated from the, public, from, the, from the pulpit, nor should anyone. Just mentioning them can be a step forward. Sometimes in homilies, I'll say God loves us all, whether we're young or old, rich or poor, straight or LGBT. LGBT. Even something small like that can send a powerful signal. It also sends a signal to their parents and grandparents, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. Because as a, a, another pastor told me, you may not think you have any LGBT people in your parish. He, he tells us other pastors, but you certainly have parents and grandparents of LGBT people in your parish or congregation. You have people who love LGBT people in your parish. Remember that when you're talking about LGBT people, you're speaking about their children. Fourth, apologize to them. If LGBT Catholics or their families have been harmed in the, in the name of the church by homophobic comments and attitudes and decisions, apologize. And I'm speaking here to the church's ministers and to all of us, right? They were harmed by the church. You're a minister of the church. You're a member of the church. You can apologize. It doesn't solve everything, but it's a start. And I'm including lay people. People are not in ordained ministry or or, or sort of formal ministry. You're a member of a church organization, you can apologize. Fifth, this is especially important for Catholics. Do not reduce gays and lesbians to the call to chastity that we all share as Christians. LGBT people are more than their sexual lives, but sometimes that's all they hear about. Remember not to focus solely on sexuality, but on the many other joys and sorrows in their lives. They lead rich lives. Many LGBT people are parents themselves or are caring for aging parents. Many help the poor in their community. Many are involved in civic or charitable organizations. They are often deeply involved in the life of the parish. See them in their totality. And if you're a Catholic and talking about chastity with LGBT people, do the same for straight people as well. Six, include them in ministries. As I mentioned, there is a tendency to focus on the sexual morality of LGBT parishioners in the Catholic Church, which is wrong, because first, you have often have no idea what their sexual lives are like. And second, even if they are falling short, they are not the only ones. As a result, LGBT people may feel that they have to be dishonest about who they are in their parish and that they have no place in Catholic ministry. Like everyone else in a Catholic parish who does not live up to the Gospels, which is everyone, LGBT people should be invited into all parish ministries, Eucharistic ministers, music ministers, lectors, bereavement ministry, every ministry. And by the way, by not welcoming them, the church misses out on their gifts. They will simply go to where they are welcome, to where they can bring their whole selves. Also, asking someone who has felt uh, left out uh, his or her life uh, just simply to be something like a lector can be life changing for them. Truly, believe me, people have told me that. Seven, acknowledge their individual gifts. Not only should we acknowledge the gifts that LGBT people offer to the Catholic Church as a group, but their individual gifts should be valued. For example, one of the cantors in my Jesuit parish is a gay man named Philip. He's a great guy. He's kind and compassionate, and his beautiful voice has made him an essential part of our worship for 20 years. In fact, I often tell Philip, when I die and go to heaven, I'm going to have a voice like yours. And he often says, well, whose voice am I going to have? You probably have similar people in your own parish or church organization. Remember how important it is to acknowledge them, especially if they're LGBT, to praise them, to raise them up. Don't hide their light under your bushel basket. Eight, invite everyone in the parish staff to welcome them. All right, here's the thing. You may have a welcoming pastor, right? I mean, you know, probably have a welcoming pastor. But what about everybody else? Does the person answering the phone know what to say to a lesbian couple? who wants to have their child baptized? 
At funerals, are the adult, the gay adult children of the deceased treated with the same respect as other children? What about the teacher in a parish school who has two fathers coming to a parent teacher conference? How does the deacon treat the father of a gay man who has just died and wants a funeral for his son? Are gay and lesbian Catholics welcome in bereavement groups when a partner dies? Is your parish open to the children of all couples, not just straight couples? Is your parish educated in the full range of church teaching on non-discrimination and parish outreach? The voice of your parish is not just your pastors, but everyone's. Think about it this way, by not welcoming and by excluding LGBT people, the church is falling short of its call to be God's family. By excluding LGBT people, you are breaking up God's family. You are tearing apart the body of Christ. Nine, sponsor special events or develop an outreach program. Like everyone else, LGBT Catholics, LGBT Christians want to feel part of their church. And as for all its children, the onus is on the church to invite them into the community. But for many LGBT people, the church has not been a place of welcome. So specific LGBT events and outreach programs are helpful to bridge the gap between your intentions and their suspicions. As for events, there are lots of possibilities. Let me just offer a few. You can have a mass of welcome, a weekend retreat, a prayer service, a day of recollection, a book club, a speaker. And by the way, speaking events don't have to be focused solely on LGBT issues. That is, sponsor a speaker to talk to LGBT parishioners about prayer. Or show a video about a topic that people need to be informed on, like the experience of transgender people. As for LGBT outreach ministries, there's lots of different models, at least in the Catholic Church. And uh, it's been interesting, you know, as I've gone around and talked to different parishes, the different kinds of models. They range from programs where LGBT people speak with one another privately, right, kind of sharing groups, to ones where LGBT parishioners meet together with other parishioners, to education programs on church teaching, to more holistic approaches where the group does not focus on sexuality, but on the many other questions that LGBT people face, to family groups for parents, to groups that do outreach to the LGBT community in the area, right, like working in shelters for LGBT youth, to what you might call blending in programs where the parish includes LGBT topics as one element among many in the parish in adult education, social justice programs, and youth ministry. All this depends on your parish. 10, advocate for them. Be prophetic. There are many times when the church can provide a moral voice for this persecuted community. And I'm not talking about hot button topics like same-sex marriage, at least hot button in the Catholic church. I'm talking about incidents in countries where gay men are rounded up and thrown in jail, or even executed for being gay, gay. And lesbians are raped to cure them of their sexual orientation. In some countries, as I said, you can be executed, okay? And so LGBT issues are life issues. Uh, we in the Catholic Church are fond of talking about pro-life, being pro-life. Well, in many countries, LGBT issues are pro-life issues. In other countries, it may be responding to incidents of teen suicides or hate crimes, or violent bullying, right? Uh, occasions of violence. So there are many opportunities for Catholic parishes to stand with LGBT people who are being persecuted. The Catechism says, every sign of unjust discrimination must be avoided when it comes to LGBT people. Do we believe that? The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith wrote in 1986, this is quite something, it is deplorable that homosexual persons have been and are the object of violent speech and action. Such treatment deserves condemnation from the church's pastors whenever it occurs. It's very strong. This is part of what it means to be Christian, standing up for the marginalized, the persecuted, the beaten down. Pope Francis is fond of talking about going to the peripheries, right? going to the margins. This is where LGBT people feel they are in the church. But it's shocking how little the Catholic Church has done this. Let your LGBT friends know that you stand with them. Mention their persecution in a homily when appropriate or in the prayers of the faithful. Be prophetic, be courageous, be like Jesus. Because if we're not trying to be like Jesus here, what's the point? And remember in his public ministry, Jesus continually reached out to people who felt like they were on the margins. The movement for Jesus was from the outside in, right? He's bringing people on the outside in. He's also asking his disciples to go out to the margins. Uh, he's bringing people who felt on the outside into the community. Because for Jesus, there's no us and them. There's just us. To that end, I'd like to close with a story from the Gospels 
to help us meditate on our call to welcome and respect LGBT people and their families into our churches. And I've really thought a lot about this over the past few years, and it's, it's, a, it's a reading that I just find so rich. And it's uh, the story of Zacchaeus. I hope you all remember the story of Zacchaeus. The Gospel of Luke tells the beautiful story of Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus. He's traveling through Jericho, which is a huge city. Uh, it's, it's the oldest continually inhabited city in the world. And Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem towards the end of his ministry. So he would have been well known in the area. As a result, he probably had a large crowd following him. In Jerusalem, there's a man named Zacchaeus. He is the chief tax collector in the region. And so therefore would have been seen by the Jewish people in the area as the chief sinner. Why? Because he would have been seen as colluding with the Roman authorities. So Zacchaeus was someone who was probably on the outs with everyone. Now here, I would like you to think of Zacchaeus as the symbol for the LGBT person in the church. Not because LGBT people are any more sinful than the rest of us, because we're all sinners, but because they feel so marginalized. I want you to think of the LGBT person as Zacchaeus, okay? Luke, to begin with, Luke's gospel describes Zacchaeus as short in stature, okay? Now, obviously, that's a reference to his height. But in English, how little stature do LGBT people often feel that they have in the church, right? They feel that they have no stature or standing in the church. Luke also says that Zacchaeus could not see Jesus on account of the crowd. Again, that was because of his height, but how often does the crowd get in the way of the LGBT person encountering Jesus, right? When are we in the church part of the crowd that doesn't let the LGBT person come close to God? So what does Zacchaeus do? He climbs a tree, right? He has to do something that no one else has to do, like a lot of LGBT people have to do, right? He climbs a tree, he has to do something extra. Why? Because Luke tells us it's really beautiful. He wanted to see, quote, who Jesus was. That's what LGBT people want, just to see who Jesus is. But the crowd gets in the way. Now, here comes Jesus making his way through Jericho, probably with hundreds of people clamoring for his attention. And whom does he point to? One of the religious authorities, you know, rabbi, one of his disciples? No, to Zacchaeus, to you. And what does he say to Zacchaeus? This is really important. Does he say sinner? Does he shout, you terrible tax collector? No, Jesus says, hurry down for I must stay at your house today. It's a public sign of welcome to someone who's on the margins. Then comes my favorite line in the story. All who saw it began to grumble, right? All who saw it began to grumble, which is exactly what's happening in the Catholic Church today with LGBT people. People grumble. People go online, you'll see the grumbling. Sometimes at my talks, not at this one since it's online, there are protests and people shouting things. Why is that? Because an offer of mercy to someone on the margins always makes some people angry. And by the way, uh, the Greeks, since we're at YDS, the Greek that is used is panta, all, all in the crowd who saw it. And I was speaking to a scripture scholar recently who said that includes the disciples. All right. So they probably grumbled too. They didn't like seeing Jesus offer this, uh, this message of mercy to this person on the margins. But Zacchaeus climbs down from the tree, all right, joyfully, which is how LGBT people feel they're welcome, uh, feel when they're welcome. And as the gospel says, he stood there. The original Greek is much stronger, stathes. He stood his ground. It's a sense of him standing his ground in the face of all this grumbling, which again, how often have LGBT people had to stand their ground in the face of opposition and prejudice and even violence in their churches? Then Zacchaeus says he will give half his possessions to the poor and repay anyone he has defrauded four times over. Because an encounter with Jesus leads to a conversion, as it does for everyone. And what do I mean by conversion? I don't mean conversion therapy, obviously. The conversion that happens to Zacchaeus is the conversion that we're all called to. In the Gospels, as you know, Jesus calls it metanoia, a conversion of minds and hearts. Uh, for Zacchaeus, his conversion means giving to the poor. Now, there's an interesting translation of this. Um, one translation of the Greek uh, is not Zacchaeus saying, I will give uh, my money to the poor, but I am giving my money to the poor. Right? So Zacchaeus is already being generous. The person who people think is such a reprobate is actually already being generous. It's an interesting 
translation of that um, of the Greek. So Jesus under Zacchaeus undergoes this conversion. All of this comes from an encounter with Jesus, because Jesus's approach was more often than not community first, conversion second. Okay, this is an insight from the scripture scholar Ben Myers. For John the Baptist, he pointed out the model was to convert first, right, repent, and then be welcomed into the community. For Jesus, more often than not, it's community first, conversion second, right? Welcome and respect and outreach come first, as it does with Zacchaeus. And then whatever conversion ha happens, is happens. This is how Jesus treats people on the margins, right? Jesus seeks them out before anyone else. He encounters them, and he treats them with uh, the line from the catechism, respect, compassion, and sensitivity. So when it comes to LGBT people and their families in Catholic parishes, in the Christian church, it seems that there are two places to stand. You can stand with the crowd who grumble and oppose mercy for those on the margins, or you can stand with Zacchaeus, and more importantly, you can stand with Jesus. Thank you very much.